Well, I can print it out later. That's fine. Because this is the same slides that are on the screen right now, right? Yes, the slides are on the screen right now. Okay. Yeah, I can print it out later. Absolutely. So welcome. Uh, follow along as we take a look at an overview of adaptive learning. We're going to walk through a PowerPoint first, and then we'll go live in a course so that you can see what it looks like and different things that we can do with the course settings. <clears throat> so, you know, if you've thought about what adaptive learning means to you, most of us were thinking of, you know, differentiating the instruction, meeting our students where they're at, addressing different learning styles, personalizing the course material, using technology to, you know, reach different learning abilities. That's kind of all encompassed in what we mean by adaptive learning. And basically, you're using the computer as an interactive teaching device. So software is adapting the presentation according to student learner needs. So each one of us in a class could be sitting there and have an entirely different study plan or study course experience based on our ability levels and how we're responding to assessments that were given. So it's a very personalized approach while still addressing and holding us accountable to course objectives. So inside my math lab, we have to think about how we have a student's workflow because there are different ways to set up adaptive learning. One, you can have traditional conventional homework and tests, and you can have anything that the student does, homework or quizzes or a practice test, all of that updates the study plan. And then the study plan can be used to help students prepare for quizzes or tests or even just provide supplemental practice to homework assignments. Some faculty choose to use the study plan or the adaptive features in lieu of homework. And in order to do that, you would start with a pretest or a diagnostic test, then use a study plan, and then have a post test. And you can actually set the study plan for a particular uh, attempt on that test as well. So for example, you allow two post tests, you could require that they have to work the study plan for both or only for the first. Or you could have them work it in between the first and second attempt. There's also personalized homework, and this is where, again, a student completes a pretest. Problems are considered to be checked off and done. So that's definitely a motivation. Um, oftentimes, faculty find this works well in the beginning of the course, but if you progress into more complicated material, the effectiveness of personalized homework may decrease somewhat or substantially depending upon the content and your student's ability level. So some faculty choose to only use personalized homework in part of the course or maybe just for the first two or three chapters. But keep in mind that you do want to make sure if you use this format that your pretest is comprehensive enough to really assess the objectives for your unit as well as the fact that you want to set the appropriate mastery levels, and we'll talk a little bit more about mastery levels. You can review this later, but there's definitely some things faculty are going to want to know. So the first one is, you know, how do I really make this study plan work in my course? When we go to the study plan manager page, you'll see that you have mastery settings, coverage, and scoring, and then you'll also have options as to what is displayed to students. The mastery settings in a default in your course are at 100%. So you're going to want to make modifications to that. Otherwise, a student cannot earn mastery or kind of meet an objective and move on to a new objective until they've had 100%. So if your homework, quizzes, tests, sample tests, quiz me's, whatever updates that would have to be at 100%. Typically, best practice, that's tests and quizzes, at 80%. And then homework anywhere between 80, 90, even 100, that depends because some faculty feel strongly that if a student is using all the learning aids, then the homework mastery level should be set higher. At your course settings level, something that you can do that helps this whole process work more effectively is modify the coverage for your course. So here you see a screen where the textbook has 17 chapters but only 10 of them were chosen because the other material is not used in this course. That makes sure that one, students aren't directed to questions that you don't cover for practice in the study plan, and two, <clears throat> excuse me, the correct mapping is in place for the material that they're going to be looking at 
The flip side is you may want to include some of those other chapters if they contain remedial material. So if, for example, you're teaching a college algebra course, but you do have some remedial chapters for basic algebra, you may want to include them so students have additional practice. Mm -hmm. And there's a screen where we can check or uncheck chapters based on whether we need them or don't need them. Any questions on that so far? No, it's very helpful. Okay. So the mastery settings, again, this is more detailed. This is what the page looks like if we want to go modify mastery settings. This particular school chose 73% for their dev math. Um, again, the typical, the best practice is 80% or 85%, some higher and obviously some a little lower. The quiz me's are little mini quizzes that are generated inside the study plan. They are typically five questions long. The default is 131 for easy, medium, hard and they focus on one objective at a time. So it's a nice way for students to self-quiz on small chunks of material. These do not count in your grade. These are just part of their practice in the study plan. You do not create the quiz me's, but they are created based on questions that you allow to be used in the study plan. Then we would look at what's called coverage and scoring in your study plan. So first of all, you can choose to include objectives and questions for practice, and then you can drill down to the section level and even modify the number of questions. So if you've ever taken a look at the study plan, oftentimes faculty will say, wow, there are a lot of questions here. This might be a little overwhelming for my students, or they're not quite sure where they are in the study plan because there's this long list of chapters and objectives and sections. So you can actually come into the study plan question detail page and remove some questions. You have some choices to use all the questions or maybe just questions similar to those you already have in your assessments or every third, fourth, or fifth question or even questions that you're not using in your assignments. And you can customize this however you want. It does take a little time, however, to do this section by section. So I typically recommend to faculty just for that part alone you're going to have to sit and click through all the sections in your course and one by one click this, update, click this, update. So it does take a little bit of time. Then there are mismatch messages in your grade book. So if you're using adaptive learning, you will have mismatch messages, which can be really helpful. And there are two of them highlighted here, for two alerts highlighted on the right-hand side. One is the mastery and the other is the coverage. The mastery mismatch and the coverage mismatch both give you really important information about your students. The mastery mismatch means that they previously mastered an objective, but now it's recommended again. And this I typically see with my students when they've mastered something on homework using learning aids, but then when it came time for a quiz or a test, they did not have learning aids or time has elapsed since they did those problems, and they just did not do well on the test on those objectives. Mm -hmm. So now they will be recommended to work on those objectives, even though it looked as if they had mastered them before. The coverage mismatch is a different type, and this one indicates that there's previously omitted objectives in your course that are now recommended. So this is a nice way of finding out if your students are missing some prerequisite material consistently or if you might want to add in some remedial support in certain sections. So for example, in one of my courses, I recognized that we were looking at graphs. It was in statistics. We were looking at line of regression and scatter plot and I would talk about slope and I would have questions and students would just look at me like we've never learned about slope and I know that they did. Mm -hmm. Well, sure enough, what would show up here is that there were coverage mismatches and they did not remember basic concepts about slope. So in that homework assignment, I added some questions from our algebra book that reviewed the concepts of slope and that helped a lot and I get a lot fewer coverage mismatches the next couple times around. Then we have the option for what is called the companion study plan. You probably heard about this or seen this as you were creating a quiz or a test. So what happens is instead of students seeing the entire page for the study plan, you can create what's called a companion study plan, and they only see the portion of the study plan that specifically relates to the test or quiz that they're working on next. So it's a really nice way to break down the study plan and still provide students with that remediation and support that you're looking for. 
when you're creating or editing a test, all it involves initially is checking this small box below the name of the test, saying that I want to assign a companion study plan as a prerequisite for the test. If you do assign the companion study plan, then you can actually remove the study plan link right from your menu because students are only going to see the study plan for that chapter test. So if they click to take a test, for example, here at chapter three, they get a little green prerequisite flag and it indicates you need to complete the study plan first. And if they click on that, they will only see what they need for chapter three. In addition to that, in your assignment manager, there's two things you would want to do. One, you want to have the results of assignments update the study plan, and we mentioned that briefly earlier. And two, you want to make sure that you set the number of objectives that students need to earn in order to unlock a test. The default, again, is 100% of the objectives. So in this particular case, the Chapter 7 post-test that's shown here had 13 objectives the default would be that students must earn all 13 objectives before they could unlock that test. Most of the time we recommend that you give students a little bit of leeway, one or two or three objectives depending upon how many objectives are there, or for example if it's a practice final, maybe asking them to have 80% of the objectives before they can unlock the test. Just to give them a little bit of flexibility, because especially procrastinating to the last minute, they may run out of time to unlock that test. So on this page, we're taking a look at the study plan results in the grade book. So this is a more recent update where we can get some really detailed information about students and their performance on the study plan. So here we have the arrow pointing to the time spent because I've had questions about that, particularly if somebody used other products and they're used to getting a time spent report. You can see how much time students have spent on questions, both in the practice as well as the little quizzes. I personally tend to focus more on the questions and objectives, you know, how many questions have they done, how many problems have they gotten correct, how many objectives have they mastered. But what's nice on the study plan view is that you can view either this overall course results or you can view it by the companion study plan, and we'll see that in the course. What that does is show us quickly, like, how are students doing with respect to a particular chapter. You can even then run an item analysis and see specifically which objectives they're struggling with. Personalized homework we talked about again a little bit before. Um, how can you work with it to make it better? So a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, you can personalize homework with media in it. Sometimes people are insistent that that's not going to work, but you can still have media and homework and personalize it. So students, so everybody at least has some questions to view. They get to look at certain media. Everybody to do certain word problems, even if they did well on the test. You can configure it that students will still have work regardless of how well they did. You can also, again, keep in mind that you should remember your mastery level settings. So sometimes people design personalized homework, but they forget to change the mastery level, and the default is 100%, which means no one would test out of anything unless they had 100% on those questions. And again, a cautionary note about objectives and mm -hmm. mastery. Another tool that you might want to look at using adapting in your classroom would be learning catalytics. This is not something that you program into my math lab or any other, or my stat lab, but learning catalytics is directly embedded and linked with your My Labs course, and this allows you to get some real-time feedback on how your students are doing, get some information, and be able to redirect them on the spot. And then uh, just a quick overview, and again, we'll talk about this later, but in conjunction with this workshop, you can qualify to do a project and earn some CEUs. And again, those were developed by the ISET, International Association for Continuing Ed and Training, and Pearson is now authorized to grant CEUs. So if you kind of went through this workshop and then you completed the project and submitted it, not only do you get the opportunity for somebody to review your course and help you design your adaptive learning, but then you also have the opportunity to earn a certificate and a little acclaim badge. So this will walk you through the steps okay. to earn the accreditation. And that's just a nice way to document professional development as well. Yes, yes. yes. So let's go live in a course and take a look at what that looks like. So, oops, let's go back to the desktop. And you should see a demo mathematics course. 
And the first place that we would want to look would be our course tools if we were going to go set up adaptive learning in our course. Now, before you would want to configure your study plan and set up the mastery and so forth, the first thing that you would wanted to have done was to create your assessments that you're planning to use in your course. Because if you're going to align anything in the study plan or kind of use those assessments as a baseline, it's helpful to have them done first. So let's assume that we've already created quizzes and tests. So if we look at our assignment manager, we see some quizzes and tests and homework. So we kind of have everything in here that we're wanting to have in our course. Mm -hmm. And now we're ready to begin setting up adaptive learning. So you can, right away, change your settings for your assignments to have the results of your assignments, for example, update the study plan. So if you're familiar with the settings page, you would scroll down and there's an option to have the results update the study plan and you would click apply. Mm -hmm. And you would do that for each category, so homework, quizzes, tests, unless you don't want one of those particular categories updating the study plan. So you would go ahead and set that up. So now those assessments that you created, when students work on them, they will be sending information, if you will, about student performance directly to the software, to the adaptive learning engine, so it has a better idea of how students are doing. The next place you go is your study plan manager. And this is the screen you saw a screenshot of before. The adaptive study plan is enabled. That's the default setting for a course. If you turn it off and a student registers, you cannot turn it back on. So basically, pretty, good, pretty much a good idea to leave it turned on for your course. Then you can come in here and you can edit your mastery settings. So currently, we have 90% for homework and 80% for quizzes, tests, or sample tests. If we don't want to use those, we can remove that. And we have 80% for the quiz me's from the study plan. Again, keep in mind those quiz me's are typically five questions long, so it's nice to have a quiz me have a mastery of 80%, which means they could get one question partially wrong or totally wrong and still earn mastery for that particular objective. So we make whatever changes we want to make on the mastery page and we click update. Now that applies across the course, so whether we're doing it with a study plan or we're using personalized homework, that applies. The other component here would be your coverage and scoring. And this is where we come in. Now you can see, and I just did this as a demo, the first couple of chapters have homework, quizzes, and tests in them. So when I drill down to the section level, this is where I can choose to align my assignments with my study plan. For example, if I wanted to say only use questions like I use in my assignments, instead of seeing 56 questions here, the maximum a student would see would be 27. And if they've mastered some of these in homework, they're going to come here and see even fewer because this is sorted by objective. Okay. So I can go ahead and click Update. Now you can see why I suggested that this would take a little bit of time because you would have to go through your entire course if that's what you chose to do and update. Now other times people are like, well, you know, I really don't necessarily want to have it perfectly aligned with my assignments, but I really want students to get a nice variety without having to see 60 questions. So maybe you say every four questions. So in this particular case, they have 16 instead of 64, and they're still getting a variety of questions to practice. And it's entirely up to you which one you want to pick and apply. And you can come back and say, well, I like all those, but I really particularly like this question when I preview it. So you can just add in an extra one or you can delete certain questions too. But you would come back and do this for every section in your course. Now, going back to our study plan manager page and returning to coverage and scoring, we would notice, for example, that maybe there's some chapters we don't cover at all. And so if you don't cover some chapters, we can uncheck them to make sure that that material is not included in this course, that students are not assessed on it, and we could click update. So in other words, those we're not changing our ebook, but we're removing those questions from our test bank. So they're not going to be in the study plan if a student clicks on that chapter. The other thing you could do, as we looked at in our PowerPoint, is at the course level, remove chapters that we don't cover. In order to do that, we would go back to our main menu and click Manage Course. On the Manage Course, we can rearrange our menu, change our theme, and we can edit our My Math Lab settings. So if I click Edit the My Math Lab settings 
and I scroll down, I have a coverage page. And you've probably seen this when you created courses. Right. That's usually what people recognize it from. Right. Like, oh, I've seen that. So here you can come back and you can say, well, why would I – I don't want – I don't need a 12, 13, 14, and I don't need the geometry questions or whatever. And I can go ahead and click Save, and you'll get a warning if you've accidentally used any of those questions or anything like that. And certainly if you're creating a coordinator course, you're also going to get the warning that this will affect everybody. So, again, something you want to use judiciously, but it can definitely save you some time inside your course and make it a little bit cleaner. Now, if you come back to the study plan now, we'll see that there's a little bit of a change in here. So when I click on this page now, you'll notice that I have fewer chapters. Those chapters that we don't cover are completely removed. So there's no way a student's going to click on something from Chapter 12 and see objectives that you don't teach and not see practice questions. and None of it's in there. It's all gone. From a student's perspective, if they came and clicked on the study plan on the typical menu right now and they wanted to view their progress, they will see everything. But again, they're not going to see 12, 13, and 14. They see their appendices and all the practice sections. And this can be a little bit overwhelming. So we're thinking, well, I really would like students to just see the companion study plan. How would I set that up? Well, here we have assignments. And you can see, for example, that we have quizzes and homework and tests and so forth showing up. And here's some little prereqs set up with some homework. But I don't see any prerequisites for a test. In other words, I'd like to have students have a companion study plan. If we do that, then I can remove the study plan link, and students will just see the part of the study plan that applies to that particular test. So let's create a study plan that's a companion to a test. So in order to do that, I'm going to pick an existing test or quiz and click Edit. So we're going to do Chapter 1. We're going to click Edit. I could also do this one. I'm creating a new one. And I'm going to click Assign a Companion Study Plan. Notice as soon as I click Assign, it adds a step four to my assignment creation. And that is I'm going to define what's in my study plan. And you'll see why in a few minutes. Then we go to our page where we select and choose questions. And again, this is just a sample. So you can see some questions here. You have picked what you needed for your test. You're all happy with that. You go on to your settings page like you're used to before, set the time, um, you know, results, all of that. Now we have this additional page. It automatically populated Chapter 1 for the study plan because my Chapter 1 test covered seven questions or seven objectives, excuse me. It has those objectives marked in Chapter 1 here. And if you click, you can see that it covers the integrated review. Now, if I really wanted to add all of this, I could just click Check, and Chapter 1 would have 59 questions in it. 59 mastery points, excuse me, and objectives, and lots of questions. So it depends on the length of my test. But what's really nice is that you can customize this. So let's assume, for example, that my test was only on 1, 1 to 1, 8. But I really wanted students to do some review questions as well. Even though this was the pre-populated from my test, I could add in anything else that I'd like to add to make sure the students are getting the review that they need. So if I know, for example, that students need a little something from last chapter or from a review chapter, I can add that into my study plan. So that's what they mean by that, defining the study plan step. And you can click Save and Assign. Now you might say, well, wow, that, that test is pretty short, but now we've got this long study plan. You'll see what that looks like for a student. So if we go back to the main menu and I click on Assignments, where I have my homework and quizzes and tests, now, when I want to go take my Chapter 1 test, you're going to see that the study plan is linked there directly before it, so there's no missing it. That's the other nice, really nice part about using the assignment link. If you use the assignment option instead of homework, quizzes, tests, and study plan, everything's on one page for students. So they see their quizzes, and then they see homework, and they see their study plan and their tests. And so this will not let me take the test until I earn all of those mastery points. Now you'll also notice that it tells me I have to earn all 58 mastery points. And that might be a little bit too much. So if I want to modify that for students, I could have done that when I created the assignment. Or I can simply go to the prerequisites page and I can come here and say, no, you know what, I'm fine with students having 50 of those review points 
if they take the pretests and practice materials and they have 50 of them, that's good. They can go ahead and take that test. And if I go back to my main page now and I click to take my test, I'm going to see that my prerequisite message has changed. If I click on the study plan view, all I'm going to see is chapter one. Notice I don't see, I mean, chapter one is obviously still extensive, but I do not see anything beyond chapter one. I only see the material for chapter one. And if a student had done all of their homework and done rather well on their homework, they may come to this page and see that they're almost ready to unlock the test and they maybe just have a couple of objectives to practice instead of seeing everything for chapter one. Questions so far? Oh, I like this. This is a really nice tool. Now let me show you what it looks like live but in a course. But it's contingent upon students doing their homework appropriately. Well, if they don't do their homework, then they're going to have to come back and do additional practice in the study plan. Right. One way or another, it makes them practice before they take a test, and that's why they like. That's why I like it. So here's what it looks like in my course. If you look at my menu, I have it very simplified. I have the course tools and I have assignments. So from a student perspective, their homework, study plan, test, homework, study plan, test, everything's all nicely in a row. It really provides a clean learning path and it's personal and adaptive. So if I click on chapter three, you'll see that I only see chapter three. Now I could look at the whole course if I wanted to by clicking on that link, but students prefer typically not to do that because it can be a little overwhelming. Yes. So they can just look at the chapter that they're working on and progress through there. So for example, if I'm going into chapter eight, then I'm only gonna see chapter eight, which is really nice. Now inside my grade book, if you recall, we took a look at the fact that we could see how students are performing. So let's take a look at study plan. Now this is my current course, so there's obviously only you know two weeks and two and a half weeks worth of data in here. But you can see, for example, that they did have their first test, and I can see how students are doing with the number of objectives from that first unit. And I can click item analysis and get some additional really specific information about where my students are struggling. And I honestly could have predicted that students struggle understanding, this is my intro stats, mm -hmm. they struggle understanding the difference between statistical and practical significance, they have a difficulty understanding discrete and continuous data, um, you know, kind of the typical things that we expect them to get a little confused with making stem plots or interpreting a frequency chart. So you can kind of see the areas where they have right. some questions. So that's that's a helpful tool. And then again, remember, you can look at the companion study view, which is what we see now, or you can look at the entire course. And when that loads, it'll show you the number of overall questions that they've done, the number of objectives they mastered, and how much time they've spent in the study plan. Now again, to me, this time on task is not as meaningful as the number of questions completed, because you could theoretically have left your computer turned on and it looks like you were practicing. I'd rather see that you got questions done. I know, I'm devious, right? <laughs> but I tell students, you know, just turning it on is not enough. So we can go back into our demo course. Um, are you familiar and comfortable with modifying your course menu? Um, go ahead and go through that. Because that's often something someone asks when they want to set up adaptive learning. They really like that assignment link or they want to remove the study plan from their menu since it's already going to be embedded. Mm -hmm. So if you click Manage Course and edit your menu, it'll take you right there. If you want to, for example, hide the study plan page, you just have to hit the little filing cabinet. That'll hide it. Okay. Kind of sticks it away. It archives it. And anything else that you want to archive just to clean up your menu. Um, you can also move things around really easily and you can easily rename the titles on your menu. So for example, if this is your student grade book and you'd like it to say student grade book so that it's clear it's not you know, the one you look in, you can just click it, type a new name, click apply. Um, sometimes that's just clearer for students as well. If you want to move any tools that you use to the top of the menu, because for example, the instructor grade book, I'm in it all the time. So, you know, I might even want to make it its own little menu item. You can just type a number and it'll pull it up to the top of your menu. Or you can just click and drag, which is really nice.
So you'll notice that I use the assignment link. The assignment link is often not showing. Often you'll see homework, quizzes, and tests, and you'll have to go to your restore page and then restore the assignments, and then you can see that I archived homework, study plan, and quizzes and tests. Questions? Uh, no. That just helps if you're designing a learning path, um, because again, depending upon what you would like your course to look like, you could actually have something that looks like this. So I'm going to show you a model. This particular course actually uses kind of a modular format. So Chapter 7, Chapter 8, Chapter 9, the chapters or the units, if you will, or modules are broken out. And this particular course actually has a diagnostic in the beginning and an information page that explains that this sample breaks it up into different models of adaptive learning. So you can have in a conventional homework, as we talked about in our PowerPoint, where students do homework and then they use the study plan to remediate additional objectives before they take a test. You could do personalized homework, and that's kind of what's modeled in Chapter 8. Or you could look at a pre-post test and use the study plan in lieu of homework, which is what's modeled in Chapter 9. So if you're interested in that course ID, you're welcome to copy it and just take a look at how things are configured and what it looks like. And right there's your course ID, the Hollister 27396. So let's go back into our demo course and take a look. Do you have any questions on settings that we looked at, configurations, what we need to do in the grade book versus the assignment manager, things like that? No. Okay. Any other questions that pertain just to information about adaptive learning or anything like that before we would take a look at the CEU project? No. Okay. Give me just a second. I'm going to open another file. Okay. So that you didn't have to see 25 pages clicking, opening, and closing. You should see your participant guide, and this was emailed to you. It's also available on our website, and we're just going to briefly review the CEU project. So if you would like to submit that, we generally ask that you would try to do that within the next two to three weeks. And what you would do is take a copy of a course that you teach with, for example, or that you're creating, and then modify the course coverage and study plan settings like we talked about today modify the number of questions in the study plan, set up a companion study plan for at least one or two of your quizzes and tests, make sure that your assignments are updating the study plan, if you're going to use personalized homework, that you, you know, set that up and link it with your tests, and then basically you would kind of give a quick little Word document summary of the customizations that you had made, as well as your course ID, and the course ID would be set for copying then we would take a look at that, review, go in and say, yes, your settings are set up properly, and you know, review over your suggestions and customizations, give you any additional feedback, and then just submit that to um, our admin team to make sure that you would get a certificate and a, a claim badge. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. There is a rubric, if you scroll a little bit further, that we would kind of use to take a look and view of this. So basically, your CEU, would ha your project would have to be adequate or excellent. We would give you the feedback, and then we would make sure that you got the certificate and, and the badge after that. And that is a, these kinds of projects are available for all of our workshops that we offer. So that's something that, you know, if you can't take advantage of it now, you can certainly take advantage of it with another workshop in the future. Okay. Okay. So other questions that you may have today? Uh, no questions. 